All right, so this is uh, from the middle of the story and it's when my two characters are together in the library. Was it wrong to look forward to our conversations this way? Nothing we talked about was inappropriate. Anyone else in the library could overhear anything we said and frequently did. Still, I found myself as captivated by him as I'd been the first time I, we met. Once, eager to underline our respective points with backup from the text, we'd reached for the book at the same time and our hands had brushed. In the instant before Kenneth drew back, whispering apologies, I was swept by the same all-consuming shiver that had rippled through me when I'd handed him Paradise Lost. What might such a thing mean? Did he feel it too? If so, he gave no sign. Whatever it meant, it couldn't be good. I had to hide it from him and everyone else at all costs. All I'd ever wanted was to be good at my job. Now here he was destroying everything. And yet, at the thought of our sessions together ending, a sick feeling curdled my stomach. The fall passed this way, dying slowly into winter. On the eighth week of our idle day tutoring sessions, we just finished discussing Calypso's sinful behavior towards Odysseus when Kenneth glanced up at me. You wanna take a walk, he said. A what? I gaped at him. In the two months we'd meant to study, we'd never once left the confines of the library. A walk, Mary. He raised an eyebrow. As a medical professional, I'm recommending it. We spent an awful lot of time sitting and you know, cardiovascular activity is important for overall health. It occurred to me that he was teasing me, not a typical occurrence in the Commonwealth. Very funny, I said, my voice dry. And what did you call me? He had the good grace to blush, ducking his head as he'd done that first day in the library when Arik had given him a hard time about misshelving books. Mary, he said, making it a question. My name was Miriam. No one had ever called me anything else. Nicknames weren't illicit in the Commonwealth, just pointless. But I found I liked the sound of Mary and Kenneth's mouth, like I was someone else with him, a braver, freer version of myself, a girl who might actually go on a quest like Odysseus. I'm sorry, he said, pushing his chair back from the table as if he thought I might ask him to leave. Did I offend you? I think of you that way sometimes, like a sort of shorthand. I'm not offended, I told him, doing my best to suppress the frizzle of excitement that swept through me at the idea that he thought of me when we weren't together. Maybe someday soon I'd get over this, like the bout of influenza I'd had last autumn. Until then, I'd have to pretend it didn't exist. And yes, fine, we can continue our discussion outside, but first reshelve the Odyssey, properly, of course. So bossy, he said giving me that impossible smile of his, but he did as I said. I found myself watching him as he lifted the book from the table and strolled to the shelves, stretching to put the Odyssey back where it belonged and dropped my eyes, horrified, a hot blush heating my cheeks. I had no business noticing the lean, long line of his back as he slid the book into place or the way his dark hair fell into his eyes and he brushed it back again. This could only end in disaster. And as, as he made his way back to our table, I stood hurriedly, my eyes on the ground. He stopped in front of me, clearing his throat. Your face is all red, Mary, he said, pitching his voice low so as not to disturb the smattering of other citizens in the library. Are you feeling all right? Do you have a fever? He lifted his hand as if to press it to my forehead and I leapt backward, nearly tripping over my chair. I'm fine, it's just hot in here, can we go? Of course, he said dropping his hand to his side, but I caught the hint of puzzlement in his eyes. After you, I strode toward the door, more embarrassed than ever. What had he made of my peculiar behavior? With any luck, he'd think I had wanted for him to touch my forehead because it was improper, not because I nursed a secret sinful desire to feel his fingers on my skin. Outside, the frigid air cooled my burning cheeks. It was December a week before the celebration of the architect's arrival that marked the turn of the new year. This ceremony constituted the Commonwealth's only festivities. Everyone would gather in Clockwork Square and the surrounding streets, even the executor and the priests. There would be a bonfire and spiced hot chocolate and chanting. It was the one time of year all of us came together for celebration. Kennett led the way through the square, 
which was crowded with people enjoying the fresh air during idle day. We passed Genevieve who glared at us both. It was her default expression. Still, I felt a twinge of uneasiness at the sight. I reassured myself for the thousandth time that Kenneth and I were doing nothing wrong. We were simply a tutor and a student taking a walk during which we would discuss the finer points of the Odyssey. Still, I couldn't shake the suspicion there was something amiss, something Kenneth wasn't telling me. Otherwise, why choose to leave the library now after two months of studying inside? Kenneth leading the way, we stepped off the cobblestones of the square and onto the path that led to the outskirts of the city and the vineyards where the priests grew the grapes for our ceremonial wine. That warning sense flared again, stronger this time. Where are we going? I asked Kenneth, my skepticism clear in my voice. For our walk. He spun to face me, lifting his hands, the picture of innocence. I'm not spiriting you away to the borderlands, Mary. I promise, just going for a stroll. How do you expect to exercise if you won't venture off the streets of the city? He set a brisk pace and I struggled to keep up, ignoring his ridiculous comment about the borderlands. Though gluttony was a sin and we ate no more than our allotted rations each day, Poring over books day in and day out hadn't done much for my physical condition. I was sufficiently winded that as we went up one hill and down another, I didn't waste my breath on conversation, at least not until we came to a stop in the vineyards. I looked around at the bare arbors and the skeletal remnants of the vines. You wanna talk about the Odyssey here? A shifty look crossed his face and the alarm bells inside me clanged at a fever pitch. Or you don't wanna talk about the Odyssey at all. I fisted my hands and my hips. What are we really doing here, Kenneth? He looked left, then right, as if assuring himself we were alone. I have a question to ask you, Mary, he said, lowering his voice. And before you say no, hear me out. A question you couldn't ask me in the library. To the nine hells and back again with this mess. I knew I should turn around and walk right back the way we'd come, but curiosity held me in place. What could Kenneth possibly have to ask me that was so important he needed to keep the conversation a secret? He scuffed his regulation brown leather shoes in the dirt, his voice pitched just above a whisper. Even though we were alone in the vineyards, you never knew who might be listening. You know how much being a good medic matters to me. I do the most I can for my patients, but I know there must be more. I can feel it. There's so much I don't know. Raising his head, he met my eyes. I get so frustrated sometimes, Mary. It's not a matter of pride. I just, I want to be able to heal them and it troubles me so much when I can't. It's my calling the way being a scholar is yours. He was sincere, I could feel it. Still, I didn't understand why he was telling me this. Your concern for your patience is admirable, Kenneth, but what does any of this have to do with me? His gaze held mine and I fought not to look away. I know the library has a restricted section. There have to be more medical books in there, there must be. You want me to get you into the restricted stacks? My voice squeaked. I don't have a key. I have to get one from a senior scholar. And even then you need permission from the priests. I I'd have to fill out the paperwork. You misunderstand. I don't want a single book like you get with a formal request. I want to see all of them. So I decide for myself what I need to learn. There was a quiet insistence to his voice I'd never heard before. People's lives are at stake and information is given to us in dribs and drabs, just enough to do our jobs. I'm a good medic, but I could be so much better. I just need to know more. I backed away from him, shaking my head. I can't, can it? No matter how noble your cause, if we got caught, I'd lose my job. We won't get caught. His voice was honeyed, convincing. I thought about this a lot. We can go during the celebration of the, on the eve of the architect's arrival. It's dark and the streets will be crowded. No one will notice we're missing. It would be the best chance we'd have. But still, how could I justify taking such a risk? I shook my head again, feeling vaguely regretful when I saw the disappointment in his eyes, but not re regretful enough to change my mind. I'm sorry, Kenneth, I, I can't, but he didn't give up. I have a young patient, Annalise, in my care who's sick with a fever she can't shake. I've tried everything. She's getting worse and worse. What if there's something in those stacks that could save her life? I froze my foot catching on a root that protruded from the soil and almost dumping me onto the ground. Kenneth caught me by the arm, then let go as if the act had scorched his fingertips. Please, Mary, he said, his eyes fixed on mine. There's no time for the paperwork and I can't just let her die. I didn't know what to do. 
On the one hand, doing as he asked would be violating the letter of my oath. And though I didn't know what the punishment would be, I was sure it would be swift and terrible. That was one of the worst parts of the priest's punishments, how each time they had devised them to fit the sinner in the sin, unerringly coming up with what would devastate you the most. No two punishments were the same. And somehow, not knowing what to expect made it all the more terrifying. It made me quake to think of facing the consequences of violating the oath I'd sworn. On the other hand, my life was dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge. If I refused Kenneth now, was my oath just empty words? Giving Kenneth access to the stacks would be upholding the spirit of my promise, if not the letter, wouldn't it? And if there was knowledge in the restricted section that could save the life of a child, how could I stand in his way? It was sinful to care for this child as I suspected Kenneth might, but perhaps his feelings went no further than a medic's sworn duty. And I imagine he could no longer let a, no sooner let a patient die if he had the power to save them, than I could willfully set the library's books aflame, no matter what my nightmares held. In all the books we've been reading together, the hero took a risk and made a difference. What if this was my chance? Kenneth stood still, those clear green eyes scanning my face. Please, Mary, he said again, please help me. And that's it.